Welcome to Stories with Liz and part two of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Stave three, the second of the three spirits. Awaking in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore and sitting up in bed and getting his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one. He felt that he was restored to consciousness in the right nick of time for the especial purpose of holding a conference the second messenger dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention. But finding that he turned uncomfortably cold when he began to wonder which of his curtains this new specter would draw back, he put them every one aside with his own hands and lying down again, established a sharp lookout all around the bed, for he wished to challenge the spirit on the moment of its appearance, and did not wish to be taken by surprise and made nervous. Gentlemen of the free and easy sort, who plume themselves on being acquainted with a move or two, and being usually equal to the time of day, expresses the wide range of their capacity for adventure by observing that they are good for anything from pitch and toss to manslaughter, between which opposite extremes, no doubt, there lies a tolerably wide and comprehensive range of subjects. Without venturing for Scrooge quite as hardly as this, I don't mind calling on you to believe that he was ready for a good broad field of strange appearances, and that nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing, and consequently, when the bell struck one and no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. All this time he lay upon his bed, the very core and center of a blaze of ruddy light which streamed upon it when the clock proclaimed the hour, and which being only light was more alarming than a dozen ghosts, as he was powerless to make out what it meant or would be at, and was sometimes apprehensive that he might be at that very moment an interesting case of spontaneous combustion without having the consolation of knowing it. At last, however, he began to think, as you or I have thought at first. For it is always the person not in the predicament who knows what ought to have been done in it, and would unquestionably have done it too. At last, I say, he began to think the source and secret of this ghostly light might be in the adjoining room, from whence, on further tracing it, it seemed to shine. This idea taking full possession of his mind, he got up softly and shuffled into his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called him by his name and bade him enter, and he obeyed. It was his own room, there was no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that dull petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time or Marley's or for many and many winter season gone. Heaped upon the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum pudding, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and seething bowels of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. 
In Ease's state upon his couch there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up, high up, to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, exclaimed the ghost. Come in and know me better, man. Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before the spirit. He was not the dodged Scrooge he had been, and though the spirit's eyes were very kind and clear, he did not like to meet them. I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirit. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple deep green robe or mantle, bordered with white fur. This garment hung so loosely on the figure that its capacious breast was bare, as if disdaining to be warded or concealed by any artifice. Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head it wore no other covering than a holy wreath, set here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eyes, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, and its joyful air. Girded round its middle was an antique scabbard, but no sword was in it, and the ancient sheet was eaten up with rust. You have never seen the likes of me before, exclaimed the spirit. Never. Scrooge made to answer to it. Have never walked forth with the younger members of my family, meaning, for I am very young, my elder brothers born in these later years, pursued the phantom. I don't think I have, said Scrooge. I am afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, spirit? More than eighteen hundred, said the ghost. A tremendous family to provide for, muttered Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas present rose. Spirit, said Scrooge submissively, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I have learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have ought to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told, and held it fast. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkeys, geese, game, poultry, prawn, meat, pigs, sausages, oysters, pies, puddings, fruits, and punch all vanished instantly. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of the night, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning where, for the weather was severe, the people made a rough, but brisk and not unpleasant kind of music in scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings and from the tops of their houses, whence it was mad delight to the boys to see it come plumbing down into the road below and splitting into artificial little snowstorms. The house fronts looked bleak enough and the windows bleaker, contrasting with smart white sheet of snow upon the roofs and with the dirtier snow upon the ground, which last deposit had been plugged up in deep furrows by the heavy wheels of carts and wagons, furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times where the great streets branched off and made intricate channels, hard to trace in the thick yellow mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy, and the shortest streets were choked up with a dingy mist, half thawed, half frozen, whose heavier particles descended in a shower of soddy atoms, as if all chimneys in Great Britain had, by one consent, caught fire and were blazing away to their dear heart's content. There was nothing very cheerful in the climate or the town, and yet there was an air of cheerfulness abroad that the clear summer air and brightest summer sun might have devoured to diffuse in vain. For the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another from the parapets, 
and now and then extending a factitious snowball, better-natured missile far than many a wordy jest, laughing heartily if it went right, and not less heartily if it went wrong. The poulterers' shops were still half open, and the fruit ears were radiant in their glory. There were great round pot-bellied basket of chestnuts, shaped like the waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen, lolling at the doors and tumbling out into the street in their apoplectic opulence. There were ruddy brown-faced, board-girded Spanish onions shining in their fatness of their growth like Spanish fairs, and winking from their shelves in wanton slyness at the girls as they went by, and glanced demurely at the hung-up mistletoe. There were pears and apples clustered high in blooming pyramids. There were bunches of grapes made in the shopkeeper's benevolence, dangled from conspicuous hooks that people's mouth may water gratis as they passed. There were piles of filberts, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance ancient walks among the woods and pleasant shufflings ankle-deeps through the withered leaves. There were Norfolk biffins, squabs and swarty, setting off the yellow of the orange and lemons, and in the great compactness of their juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. The very gold and silver fish set forth among these choice fruits in a bowl, though members of dull and stagnant blooded race appeared to know that there was something going on, and to a fish went gasping round and round their little world in slow and passionless excitement. The grocers, oh, the grocers, nearly closed, with perhaps two shutters down or one, but through those gaps such glimpses, it was not alone that the scales descending on the counter made a merry sound, or that the twine and roller parted company so briskly, or that the canister were rattled up and down like juggling tricks, or even that the blended scents of tea and coffee were so grateful to the nose or even that the raisins were so plentiful and rare, the almonds so extremely white, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, the other spices so delicious, the candied fruits so caked and spotted with mold and sugar, and to make the coldest cook on feel faint and subsequently bilious. Nor was it that the figs were moist and pulpy, or that the French plums blushed in modest tartness from their highly decorated boxes, or that Everything was good to eat and in its Christmas dress. But the customers were all so hurried and so eager in the hopeful promise of the day that they tumbled up against each other at the floor, crashing their wicker baskets wildly, and left their purchases upon the counter and came running back to fetch them, and committed hundreds of like mistakes in the best humor possible. While the grocer and its people were so frank and fresh that the polished hearts with which they fastened their aprons behind might have been their own, worn outside for general inspection and for Christmas dolls to peek at if they choose. But soon the steeples called good people all to church and chapel, and away they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes and with their gazed faces, and at the same time there emerged from scores of by-streets, lanes, and nameless turnings, innumerable people carrying their dinner to the baker shop. The sight of these poor revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge beside him in a baker's doorway, and, taking off the covers as their bearers passed, sprinkled incense on their dinner from his torch. And it was a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice, when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who had jostled each other, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humor was restored directly. For they said it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day. And so it was. God love it, so it was. In time the bell ceased, and the bakers were shut up, and yet there was a genial shadowing forth of all these dinners, and the progress of their cooking, and the thawed blotch of wet above each baker's oven, where the pavement smoked as if stones were cooking too. Is there a particular flavor in that sprinkle from your torch? asked Scrooge. 
There is my own. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day? Asked Scrooge. To any kindly given, to a poor one most. Why to a poor one most? Asked Scrooge. Because it needs it most. Spirit, said Scrooge after a moment's thought. I wonder you, of all the beings in the many worlds about us, should desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment. I, cried the spirit, you would deprive them of their means of dining every seventh day, often the only day on which they can be said to dine at all, said Scrooge. Wouldn't you? I, cried the spirit, you seek to close these places on the seventh day, said Scrooge, and it comes to the same thing. I seek, exclaimed the spirit. Forgive me if I'm wrong. It has been done in your name, or at least in that of your family, said Scrooge. There are some upon this earth of yours, returned the spirit, who lay claim to Noah's and who do their deeds of passion, pride, ill-will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name, who are as strange to us and all our keith and kind as if they had never lived, remember that, and charge their doings on themselves and not us. Scrooge promised that he would, and they went on, invisible as they had been before, into the suburbs of the town. It was a remarkable quality of the ghost which Scrooge had observed at the baker's that notwithstanding his gigantic size, he could accommodate himself to any place with ease, and that he stood beneath a low roof quite as gracefully and like a supernatural creature as it was possible he could have done in any lofty hall. And perhaps it was the pleasure the good spirit had in showing off his powers of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature and his sympathy with all poor men that led him straight to Scrooge's clerks, for there he went, and Scrooge with him, holding to his robe, and on the threshold of the door the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinkling of his torch. Think of that, Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself, he pocketed on Sundays but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly, in a twice-turned gown but brave in ribbons, which are cheap and make a good show for sixpence, and she laid the cloth assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughter, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son and heir in honor of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, Boy and girl came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it for their own, and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion. These young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchits to the skies, while he, not proud although his collar nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up, knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. Whatever has got your precious father, then? said Mrs. Cratchit. And your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha weren't as late as this last Christmas by half an hour. Here's Martha, mother, said a girl, appearing as she spoke. Here's Martha, mother, cried the two young Cratchits. Hurrah! There's such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are. 
said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her with officious seal. We had a deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind, as long as you've come, said Mrs. Cratchit. Sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warmth, Lord bless ye. No, no, there's father coming. Hide, Martha, hide. So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter, exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas, for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking around. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with a sudden declension in his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church and had come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if only that were in joke. So she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms while the two young Cratchits hustled tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did our little Tim behave? asked Mrs. Cratchit when she had railed Bob on his credulity and Bob had hugged his daughters to his heart's content. As good as gold said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken. Escorted by his brother and sister to his stool beside the fire, and while Bob, turning up his cuff, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer, and the two young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon to which a black swan was matter of course, and in truth it was something very like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a corner at the table. The two young Cratchits sat chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves. And mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths lest they would shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, preparing to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all round the board, and even tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat the table with the handle of the knife, and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness, were the themes of universal admiration. Ecked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, that they hadn't ate it all at last. 
yet everyone had had enough. And the youngest Cratchits, in particular, were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to get the pudding out and bring it in. Suppose it wouldn't be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have gotten over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were making merry with the goose. A supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello, a great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like washing day, that was the cloth. A smell like an eating house, a pastry cook next door to each other, with a laundress next door to that, that was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a specked cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half of half a quartern of ignited brandy, and bedecked with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly, too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that, now that the weight was off her mind, she would confess that she had had her doubts about the quantity of flowers. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought that it was a small pudding for such a large family. It would have been flat heresy to do so. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done. The cloth was cleaned, the hearth swept, and fire made up. The compound and the judge being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table, and a shovel full of chestnut on the fire. Then all the Cratchit's family drew around the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half a one, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. And these held the hot stuff from the judge, however, as well as golden goblets would have done. And Bob served it out with beaming looks while the chestnuts of the fire sputtered and cracked noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. Which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand to his as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side, and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge with an interest he had never felt before. Tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost. In the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved, if these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh, no. Kind spirits say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race, returned the ghost, will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decreased the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit, and was overcome with penitence and grief. Man, said the ghost, if man you be in heart, not a damon, forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is. Will you decide what man shall live and which shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless 
and less fit to live than millions, like this poor man's child. O oh God, to hear the insect on the leaf pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Scrooge bent before the ghost's rebuke and trembling cast his eye upon the ground, but he raised them speedily on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I'd hope he had a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, said she, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard-on-feeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, said Mrs. Cratchit, not for his. Long life to him, a merry Christmas and a happy new year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceeding which had no heartiness in it. Tiny Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care two pence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for full five minutes. After it had passed away, they were ten times merrier than before, for the mere relief of Scrooge the baleful being done with. Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favor when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice of a milliner's, then told them of what kind of work she had to do, and how many hours she worked at a stretch, and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good long rest, tomorrow being a holiday she passed at home. Also how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collar so high that you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time the chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost child traveling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty, and Peter might have known, and very likely did, the insight of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and content with the time, and when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sprinkles of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim till the last. By this time it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily, and as Scrooge and the spirit went along the streets, the brightness of the roaring fires in the kitchens, parlors, and all sorts of rooms were wonderful. Here the flickering of the blaze showed preparations for a cozy dinner with hot plates baking through and through before the fire, and deep red curtains ready to be drawn to shut out the cold and darkness. There all the children of the house were running out into the snow to meet their married sisters, brothers, cousins, uncles, aunts, and to be the first to greet them. Here again were shadows on the window blinds of guests assembling, and there a group of handsome girls all hooded and fur-booted, and all chattering at once, tripped lightly off to some near neighbor's house, where, woe upon the single man, and saw them enter. Artful witches, while well, they knew it, in a glow. 
But if you had judged from the numbers of people on their way to friendly gatherings, you might have thought that no one was at home to give them welcome when they got there, instead of every house expecting company and piling up its fires half chimney high, blessings on it. How the ghost exalted! How it bared its breath of breast and opened its capacious palm and floated on, outpouring with a generous hand in its bright and harmless mirth on everything within its reach. The very lamplighter, who ran on before, dotting the dusky street with specks of light, and who was dressed to spend the evening somewhere, laughed out loudly as the spirit passed, though little ken the lamplighter that he had the company but Christmas. And now, without a word of warning from the ghost, they stood upon a bleak and desert moor where monstrous masses of rude stone were cast about as though it were the burial place of giants, and water spread itself wheresoever it listened, or would have done so, but for the frost that held it prisoner and nothing grew but moss and firs and coarse rank grass, down in the west the setting sun had left a streak of fiery red which glared upon the desolation for an instant like a sullen eye and frowning lower, lower, lower yet, was lost in the thick gloom of the darkest night. What place is this? asked Scrooge. A place where miners live, who labor in the bowels of the earth, returned the spirits. But they know me. See! A light shone from the window of a hut, and swiftly they advanced towards it. Passing through the wall of mud and stone, they found a cheerful company assembled around a glowing fire. An old, old man and woman with their children and their children's children and another generation beyond that, all decked out gaily in their holiday attire, the old man in a voice that seldom rose above the howling of the wind upon the barren waste was singing them a Christmas song. It had been a very old song when he was a boy, and from time to time they all joined in the chorus. So surely as they raised their voices, the old man got quite blithe and loud, and so surely as they stopped, his figure sank again. The spirit did not tarry here, but bade Scrooge to hold his robe, and passing above the moor, spread whither? Not to see, to see, to Scrooge's horror looking back. He saw the last of the land, a frightful range of rocks behind them, and his ears were deafened by the thundering of water as it rolled and roared and raged among the dreadful caverns he had worn and fiercely tried to undermine the earth. Built upon a dismal reef of sunken rocks some league or so from shore, one which the waters chafed and dashed the wild year through, there stood a solitary lighthouse. Great heaps of seaweed clung to its base and storm birds borne off the wind, one might suppose as seaweed of the water, rose and fell about it like the waves they skimmed. But even here, two men who had watched the light had made a fire, and through the loophole in the thick stone wall shed out ray of brightness on the awful sea. Joining their horny hands over the raw table at which they sat, they wished each other Merry Christmas in their can of grog, and one of them, the elder too, with his face all damaged and scarred with hard weather, as the figurehead of an old ship might be, struck up a sturdy song that was like a gale in itself. Again the ghost sped on, above the black and heaving sea. On, on, until being far away, as he told Scrooge, from any shore that they lighted on a ship. They stood beside the helmsman at the wheel, the lookout in the bow, the officers who had the watch, dark, ghostly figures in their several stations. But every man among them hummed a Christmas tune, or had a Christmas thought, or spoke below his breath to his companion of some bygone Christmas day, with homeward's hopes belonging to it. And every man on board, Waking or sleeping, good or bad, 
had had a kinder word for one another on that day than any other day in the year, and had shared to some extent in its festivities, and had remembered those he cared for at a distance, and had known that they delighted to remember him. It was a great surprise to Scrooge. While listening to the moaning of the wind and thinking what a solemn thing it was to move on through the lonely darkness over an unknown abyss, whose depths were secret as profound as death, it was a great surprise to Scrooge while thus engaged to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with the spirit standing smiling by his side and looking at the same nephew with approving affability. Ha 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 laughed Scrooge's nephew. Ha 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 if you should happen by any unlikely chance to know a man more blessed in a laugh than Scrooge's nephew, all I can say is, I should like to know him too. Introduce me to him, and I'll cultivate his acquaintance. It is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things that while there is infection and disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed in this way, holding his sides, rolling his head, and twisting his face into the most extravagant contortions, Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends, being not a bit behindhand, roared out lustily. <laughs> He said that Christmas was a humbug. As I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it, too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless those women. They never do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty. With a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, as no doubt it was. All kinds of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in any little creature's head. Altogether, she was what you would have called provoking, you know, but satisfactory too, oh, perfectly satisfactory. He is a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That is the truth. And not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carries their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he's very rich, Fred, hinted Scrooge's niece. At least you always tell me so. What of that, my dear, said Scrooge's nephew. His wealth is of no use to him. He don't do anything good with it. He doesn't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking <laughs> that he is ever going to benefit us with it. I have no patience with him, observed Scrooge's niece. Scrooge's niece's sister and all the other ladies expressed the same opinion. Oh, I have, said Scrooge's nephew. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill wills? Himself, always. Here he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He don't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everybody else said the same, and they must be allowed to have been competent judges, because they had just had dinner, and with the dessert upon the table, were clustered round the fire by lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I haven't any great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? 
Topper had clearly got his eye upon one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast who had no right to express an opinion upon the subject, whereat Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. "'Go on, Fred,' said Scrooge's niece, clapping her hands. "'He never finishes what he begins to say. "'He is such a ridiculous fellow.' "'Scrooge's nephew reveled in another laugh, "'and as it was impossible to keep his infection off, "'though the plump sister tried hard to do it with aromic vinegar, "'his example was unanimously followed. "'I was only going to say,' said Scrooge's nephew, that the consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is, as I think, that he loses some pleasant moments, which could do him no harm. I am sure he loses pleasanter companions than he can find in his own thoughts, either in his moldy old office or his dusty chambers. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it. I defy him. If he finds me going there in good temper year after year and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk fifty pounds, that's something. And I think I shook him a little yesterday. It was their turn to laugh now at the notion of his shaking Scrooge. But being thoroughly good nature and not much caring what they laughed at, so that they laughed at any rate, he encouraged them in their merriment and passed the bottle joyously. After tea they had some music, for they were a musical family, and knew what they were about when they sang a glee or catch. I can assure you, especially Topper, who could growl away in the bass like a good one and never swell the large vein in his forehead or get red in the face over it. Scrooge's niece played well upon the harp and played among other tunes a simple little air, a mere nothing you might learn to whistle in about two minutes, which had been familiar to the child who fetched Scrooge from the boarding school, as he had been reminded by the ghost of Christmas past. When this strain of music sounded, all the things that the ghost had shown him came upon his mind. He softened more and more, and thought that if he could have listened to it often years ago, he might have cultivated the kindness of life for his own happiness with his own hands without resorting to the Saxon spade that buried Jacob Marley. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while, they played at forfeits, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas, when its mighty founder was a child himself. Stop! There was a game of blind man's buff, of course there was. And I no more believe Topper was really blind than I believe he had his eyes in his boots, my opinion is that it was a done thing between him and Scrooge's nephew, and that the ghost of Christmas present knew it. The way he went after that plump sister in the lace tucker was an outrage on the credulity of human nature, knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over the chairs, bumping up against the piano, smothering himself against the curtains, wherever she went, there went he. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anybody else if you had fallen up against him, as some of them did on purpose. He would have made a feint of endeavoring to seize you, which would have been an affront to your understanding, and would instantly have sallied off in the direction of the plump sister. She often cried out that it wasn't fair, and it really was not. But when at last he caught her, when, in spite of all her silken rustlings and her rapid fluttering past him, he got her into a corner whence there was no escape, then his conduct was more execrable, for his pretending not to know her, 
his pretending that it was necessary to touch her headdress and further to assure himself of her identity by passing a certain ring upon her finger and a certain chain about her neck, was vile and monstrous. No doubt she told him her opinion of it when, another blind man being in office, they were so very confidential together behind the curtains. Scrooge's niece was not one of the blind man's buff party, but was made comfortable with a large chair and footstool in a snug corner where the ghost and Scrooge was close behind her. But she joined in the forfeits and loved her love to admiration with all the letters of the alphabet. Likewise, at the game of how, when, and where, she was very great and to the secret joy of Scrooge's nephew beat her sisters hollow, though they were sharp girls too, as Topper could have told you. There might have been twenty people there, young and old, but they all played, and so did Scrooge. For wholly forgetting in the interest he had in what was going on, that his voice made no sound in their ears, he sometimes came out with his guess quite loud, and very often guessed right, too. For the sharpest needle, best witch to pelt, warranted not to cut in the eye, was not sharper than Scrooge blunt as he took it in his head to be. The ghost was greatly pleased to find him in this mood, and looked upon him with such favor that he begged like a boy to be allowed to stay till the guest departed. But this, the spirit said, could not be done. Here is a new game, said Scrooge. One half-hour spirit. Only one. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something and the rest must find out what, he only answering to their questions yes or no, as the case was. The brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes and lived in London and walked about the street and wasn't made a show of and wasn't led by anybody and was never killed in a market and was not a horse or an ass or a cow or a bull or a tiger or a dog or a pig or a cat or a bear. At every fresh question that was put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp. <laughs> At last the plump sister, falling into a similar state, cried out, I have found it out! I know what it is, Fred, I know what it is! What is it? cried Fred. It's your Uncle Scrooge! which it certainly was. Admiration was the universal sentiment, though some objected that the reply to is it a bear ought to have been yes. Inasmuch as an answer in the negative was sufficient to have diverted their thoughts from Mr. Scrooge, supposing they had ever had the tendency that way. He has given us plenty of merriment, I'm sure, said Fred and it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. Here is a glass of molded wine ready to our hand at the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge. Well, Uncle Scrooge, they cried. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, wherever he is, said Scrooge's nephew. He wouldn't take it from me, but may he have it nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly became so gay and light of heart that he would have pledged the unconscious company in return and thanked them in an inaudible speech, if the ghost had given him time. But the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last word spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful, on foreign lands, 
and they were close at home, by struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope, by poverty, and it was rich. In almshouse, hospital, and gaol, in misery's every refuge, where vain men in his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, he left his blessings and taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a long night, if it was only one night. But Scrooge had his doubt about this, because the Christmas holidays appeared to be condensed into the space of time they had passed together. It was strange, too, that, while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change, but never spoke of it, until they left a children's twelfth night party, when, looking at the spirit as they stood together in an open place, he noticed that his hair was gray. Are spirits' life so short? asked Scrooge. My life upon this globe is very brief, replied the ghost. It ends tonight. Tonight, cried Scrooge. Tonight at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. The chimes were ringing three quarters past eleven at that moment. Forgive me if I am not justified in what I ask, said Scrooge, looking intently at the spirit's robe. But I see something strange and not belonging to yourself protruding from your skirts. Is it a foot or a claw? It might be a claw, for the flesh there is upon it, was the spirit's sorrowful reply. Look here. From the foldings of its robe, it brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung upon the outside of his garments. Oh, man, look, look down here, exclaimed the ghost. They were a boy and a girl, yellow, meager, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate, too, in their humility. Where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints, a stale and shriveled hand like that of age had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. Where angels might have sat enthroned, devils lurked and glared out menacing. No change, no degradation, no perversion of humility in any grade throughout the mystery of the wonderful creation has monsters half so horrible and dreaded. Scrooge started back appalled, having them shown to him in this way. He tried to say that they were fine children, but the words choked themselves rather than be parties to a lie of such an enormous magnitude. Spirits, are they yours? Scrooge could not say more. They are man's said the spirit, looking down upon them. And they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. This boy is ignorance, and this girl is want. Beware of them both, and all of their degree. But most of all beware this boy, for on his brow I see that written is doom, unless the writing be erased. Deny it! cried the spirit, stretching out his hand towards the city. Slander those who tell it ye. Admit it for your factitious purposes, and make it worse, and bide the end. Have they no refuge or resource? cried Scrooge. Are there no prisons? said the spirit, turning on him for the last time with his own words. Are there no workhouses? The bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the predictions of old Jacob Marley, and, lifting up his eyes, he beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like mist along the ground towards him. Stave 4. The Last of the Spirits 
the phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the very air through which the spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible, save one outstretched hand. But for this, it would have been difficult to detach its figure from the night and separate it from the darkness by which it was surrounded. He felt that it was tall and stately when it came beside him, and that its mysterious presence filled him with a solemn dread. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come said Scrooge. The spirit answered not, but pointed onward with his hand. You are about to show me shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us, Scrooge pursued. Is that so, spirit? The upper portion of the garment was concealed for an instant in its folds, as if the spirit had inclined its head. That was the only answer he received. Although well used to ghostly company by this time, Scrooge feared the silent shape so much that his legs trembled beneath him, and he found that he could hardly stand when he prepared to follow it. The spirit paused a moment as observing his condition and giving him time to recover. But Scrooge was all the worse for this. It thrilled him with a vague, uncertain horror to know that, behind the dusky shroud, there were ghostly eyes intently fixed upon him, while he, though he stretched his own to the utmost, could see nothing but a spectral hand and one great heap of black. Ghost of the future, he exclaimed. I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear your company, and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on, said Scrooge. Lead on, the night is waning fast. And it is precious time to me, I know, I know. Lead on, spirit. The phantom moved away as it had come towards him. Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress, which bore him up, he thought, and carried him along. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them and encompass them in its own act. But there they were in the heart of it, on change amongst the merchants who hurried up and down and clinked the money in their pockets and conversed in groups, and looked at their watches, and trifled thoughtfully with their great gold seals, and so forth, as Scrooge had seen them so often. The spirit stopped besides a little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. Why, what's the matter with him? asked a third, taking a vast quantity of snuff out of a very large snuff box. I thought he'd never die. God knows, said the first with a yawn. What has he done with his money? asked the red-faced gentleman, with a ponderous excrescence on the head of his nose, and shook like the gills of a turkey cock. I haven't heard, <laughs> said the man with the large chin yawning again. Left it to his company, I perhaps. He hasn't left it to me. That's all I know. This pleasantry was received with a general laugh. It is likely to be a very cheap funeral, said the same speaker, for upon my life I don't know of anyone to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. 
I don't mind going if a lunch is provided, observed the gentleman with the extrusence on his nose, but I must be fed if I make one. Another laugh. Well, I'm the most disinterested among you after all, said the first speaker, for I never wear black gloves and I never eat lunch. But I'll offer to go if anyone else will. When I come to think of it, I'm not at all sure that I wasn't his most particular friend, for we used to stop and speak whenever we met. Bye-bye. Speakers and listeners strolled away and mixed with other groups. Scrooge knew the men and looked towards the spirit for an explanation. The phantom glided on into the street. Its finger pointed to two persons meeting. Scrooge listened again, thinking that the explanation might lie here. He knew these men also perfectly. They were men of business, very wealthy and of great importance. He had made a point always of standing well in their esteem. In a business point of view, that is. Strictly in a business point of view. How are you? said one. How are you? returned the other. Well, said the first. Old Scratch has got his own at last, eh? So I'm told, returned the second. Cold, isn't it? Seasonable for Christmas time. You are not a skater, I suppose. No, no. Something else to think of. Good morning. Not another word. That was their meeting, their conversation, and their parting. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to conversation apparently so trivial, but feeling assured that they must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. They could scarcely be supposed to have had any bearings on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past, and this ghost province was the future. Nor could he think of anyone immediately connected with himself to whom he could apply them, but nothing doubting that to whomever they applied, they had some latent moral for his own improvement. He resolved to treasure up every word he heard and everything he saw, and especially to observe the shadow of himself when it appeared, for he had an expectation of the conduct of his future self would give him the clue he missed, and would render the solution of these riddles easily. He looked around in that very place for his own image, but another man stood in his accustomed corner, and though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes that poured in through the porch. It gave him little surprise, however, for he had been revolving in his mind a change of life, and thought and hoped he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. Quiet and dark beside him stood the phantom, with its outstretched hand. When he roused himself from this thoughtful quest, he fancied, from the turn of the hand and its situation in reference to himself, that the unseen eyes were looking at him keenly. It made him shudder and feel very, very cold. They left the busy scene and went into an obscure part of the town, where Scrooge had never penetrated before, although he recognized its situation and its bad repute. The ways were foul and narrow, the shops and houses wretched, the people half-naked, drunken, slipshod, ugly. Alleys and archways, like so many chess-pools, disgorged their offenses of smell and dirt and life upon the struggling street, and the whole quarter reeked with crime, with filth and misery. Far in this den of infamous resort, there was a low, broad beetling shop, below a penthouse roof where iron, old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were bought. Upon the floor within were piled up heaps of rusty keys, nails, chains, hinges, files, scales, weights, and refuse iron of all kind. Secrets that few would like to scrutinize were bred and hidden in mountains of unseemly rags masses of corrupted fat, and spultures of bones, sitting among the wars he dealt in, by a charcoal stove made of old bricks, was a grey-haired rascal, nearly seventy years of age, who had screened himself from the cold air by a frozy curtaining of miscellaneous tatters hung up on a line, 
and smoked his pipe in all the luxury of calm retirement. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop, but she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black, who was no less startled by the sight of them than they had been upon their recognition of each other. After a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with the pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a laugh. "'Let the charwoman alone to be the first, cried she who had entered first. "'Let the laundress alone to be the second, and let the undertaker's man alone to be the third. Look here, old Joe. Here's a chance, if we haven't all three met here without meaning it. You couldn't have met in a better place, said old Joe, removing his pipe from his mouth. Come into the parlor. You were made free of it long ago, you know, and the other two ain't strangers. Stop till I shut the door of the shop. Ah, how it shrieks. There ain't such a rusty bit of metal in the place as its own hinges, I believe, and I'm sure there's no such old bone here as mine. Ha, ha, ha. We're all suitable to our calling. We're well matched. Come into the parlor. Come into the parlor. The parlor was the space behind the screen of rags. The old man raked the fire together with an old stair rod, and having trimmed his smoky lamp, for it was night, with the stem of his pipe, put it into his mouth again. While he did this, the woman who had already spoken threw her bundle on the floor and sat down in a flaunting manner on a stool, crossing her elbows on her knees and looking with a bold deference at the two others. "'What odds, then? What odds, Mrs. Dibbler?' said the woman. "'Every person has a right to take care of themself. He always did.' "'That is true indeed,' said the laundress. "'No man more so.' "'Why, then, don't stand staring as if you were afraid, woman. "'Who's the wiser? "'We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose?' "'No, indeed,' said Mrs. Dibbler and the man together. "'We should hope not.' "'Very well, then,' she cried. "'That's enough.' Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. No, indeed, said Mrs. Dibbler, laughing. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, a wicked old screw, pursued the woman. Why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying gasping out his last there, alone by himself. It's the truest words that ever was spoke, said Mrs. Dibbler. It's a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier judgment, replied the woman, and it should have been, you may depend on it, if I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open the bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it, we knew pretty well that we were helping ourselves before we met here, I believe. It's no sin. Open the bundle, Joe. But the gallantry of her friends would not allow of this, and the man in the faded black, mounting at the breach first, produced his plunder. It was not extensive. A seal or two, a pencil case, a pair of sleeve buttons, and a brooch of no great value were all. They were severely examined and appraised by old Joe, who chalked the sums he was disposed to give for each upon the wall and added them up into a total when he found that there was nothing more to come. That is your count, said Joe, and I wouldn't give another sixpence if I was to be boiled for not doing it. Who's next? Mrs. Dibbler was next, sheets and towels, a little wearing apparel, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons, a pair of sugar tongs, and a few boots, 
Her accounts were stated on the wall in the same manner. I always give too much to ladies. It's a weakness of mine. And that's the way I ruin myself, said old Joe. That's your account. If you asked me for another penny and made it an open question, I'd repent of being so liberal and knock off half a crown. And now under my bundle, Joe, said the first woman. Joe went down on his knees for the greater convenience of opening it, and having unfastened a great many knots, dragged out a large, heavy roll of some dark stuff. What do you call this? said Joe. Bed curtains? Ah! returned the woman, laughing and leaning forward on her crossed arms. Bed curtains! You don't mean to say you took em down, rings and all, with him lying there, said Joe. Yes, I do, replied the woman. Why not? You were born to make your fortune, said Joe, and you'll certainly do it. I certainly shan't hold my hand when I can get anything in it by reaching it out. For the sake of such a man as he was, I promise you, Joe, returned the woman coolly. Don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. His blankets? asked Joe. Whose else do you think? replied the woman. He isn't likely to take cold without them, I dare say. I hope he didn't die of anything catching, eh? said old Joe, stopping in his work and looking up. Don't you be afraid of that, returned the woman. I ain't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about him for such things if he did. Ah, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a treadbare place. It is the best he had, and a fine one, too. They'd have wasted it if it wasn't for me. And what do you call wasting of it? asked Joe. Putting him in it to be buried in, to be sure, replied the woman with a laugh. Somebody was fool enough to do it, but I took it off again. If calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, it isn't good enough for anything. It's quite as becoming to the body. He can't look uglier than he did in that one. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror, as they sat grouped about their spoil and the scanty light afforded by the old man's lamp, he viewed them with a detestation and disgust which could hardly have been greater, though they had been obscene demons marketing the corpse itself. Ha 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 ha, laughed the woman, when old Joe, producing a fannel bag with money in it, told out their several gains upon the ground. This is the end of it, you see. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive to profit us when he's dead. Ha 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 Spirit, said Scrooge, shuddering from head to foot. I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might have been my own. My life tends that way now, merciful heaven. What is this? He recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bed, a bare, uncurtained bed on which, beneath a ragged sheet, there lay something covered up which, though it was dumb, announced itself in awful language. The room was very dark, too dark to be absurd with any accuracy, though Scrooge glanced round it in obedience to a secret impulse, anxious to know what kind of room it was. And a pale light, ringing in the outer air, fell straight upon the bed and on it, plundered and bereft, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this man. Scrooge glanced towards the phantom. Its steady hand was pointed to the head. The cover was so scarcely adjusted that the slightest raising of it the motion of a finger upon Scrooge's part would have disclosed the face. He thought of it, 
felt how easy it would be to do and longed to do it, but he had no more power to withdraw the veil than to dismiss the specter at his side. Oh, cold, cold, rigid, dreadful death! Set up thine altar here and dress it with such terrors as thou hast at thy command, for this is thy dominion. But of the loved, revered, and honored head, thou canst not turn one hair to thy dread purposes, or make one feature odious. It is not that the hand is heavy and will fall down when released. It is not that the heart and pulse are still, but that the hand was open, generous and true, and heart brave, warm and tender, and the pulse a man. Strike, shadow, strike! And see his good deeds springing from the wound to sow the world with life immortal. No voice pronounced these words in Scrooge's ears, and yet he heard them when he looked upon the bed. He thought if this man could be raised up now, what would be his foremost thought? Ever his hard-dealing, gripping cares, they have brought him to a rich end, truly. He lay in the dark, empty house with not a man, a woman, or a child to say that he was kind to me in this or that, and for the memory of one kind word I will be kind to him. A cat was tearing at the door, and there was a sound of gnawing rats beneath the hearthstone. What they wanted in the room of death, and why they were so restless and disturbed, Scrooge did not dare to think. Spirit, he said, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me, let's go. Still the ghost pointed with an unmoved finger to the head. I understand you, Scrooge returned, and I would do it if I could, but I have not the power, spirit. I have not the power. Again it seemed to look upon him. If there is any person in the town who feels emotions caused by this man's death, said Scrooge, quite agonized, Show that person to me, spirit, I beseech you. The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment, like a wing, and withdrawing it revealed a room by daylight where a mother and her children were. She was expecting someone, and with anxious eagerness, for she walked up and down the room, started at every sound, looked out from the window, glanced at the clock, tried but in vain to work with her needle and could hardly bear the voices of her children in their play. At length the long-expected knock was heard. She hurried to the door and met her husband, a man whose face was careworn and depressed, though he was young. There was a remarkable expression in it now, a kind of serious delight of which he felt ashamed and which he struggled to repress. He sat down to the dinner that had been hoarding for him by the fire, and when she asked him faintly what news, which was not until after a long silence, he appeared embarrassed how to answer. Is it good? She said. Or bad to help him? Bad, he answered. Are we quite ruined? No. There is hope yet, Caroline. If he relents, she said, amazed, there is. Nothing is past hope. If such a miracle has happened. He is past relenting, said her husband. He is dead. She was a mild and patient creature, if her face spoke truth but she was thankful in her soul to hear it, and she said so with clasped hands. She prayed forgiveness the next moment and was sorry, but the first was the emotion of her heart. What the half-drunken woman, who I told you of last night, said to me when I tried to see him and obtain a week's delay, and what I thought was a mere excuse to avoid me, turns out to have been quite true. He was not only very ill, but dying then. 
To whom will our debt be transferred? I don't know, but before that time we shall be ready with the money, and even though we are not, it would be bad fortune indeed to find so merciless a creditor in his successor. We may sleep with light hearts tonight, Caroline. Yes, soften it as they would, their hearts were lighter. The children's faces, hushed and clustered round to hear what they so little understood, were brighter, and it was a happier house for this man's death. The only emotion that the ghost could show him caused by the event was one of pleasure. Let me see some tenderness connected with the death, said Scrooge, or that dark chamber spirit which we left just now will forever be present to me. The ghost conducted him through several streets familiar to his feet, and as they went along, Scrooge looked here and there to find himself, but nowhere was he to be seen. They entered poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated round the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits was as still as statues in one corner and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in sewing, but surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard those words? He had not dreamed them. The boy must have read them out as he and the spirit crossed the threshold. Why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. The color hurts my eyes, she said. The color? Oh, poor Tiny Tim. They're better now again, said Cratchit's wife. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather, Peter answered, shutting up his book. But I think he has walked a little slower than he used these few last evenings, mother. They were very quiet again. At last she said, and in a steady, cheerful voice that only faltered once, I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. And so have I, cried Peter, often. And so have I, exclaimed another. So had all. But he was very light to carry, she resumed, intent upon her work. And his father loved him so that it was no trouble, no trouble. And there is your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him and little Bob and his comforter. He had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob, and they all tried who should help him to it most. Then the two young Cratchits got up on their knees and laid each child a little cheek against his face as if they said, Don't mind it, father. Don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. They would be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday? You went today then, Robert, said the wife. Yes, my dear, returned Bob. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little child, cried Bob. My little child. He broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been further apart, perhaps, than they were. He left the room and went upstairs into the room above, which was lighted carefully and hung with Christmas. There was a chair set close beside the child, and there were signs of someone having been there lately. Poor Bob sat down in it, 
and when he had thought a little and composed himself, he kissed the little face. He was reconciled to what had happened and went down again quite happy. They drew about the fire and talked, the girls and the mother working still. Bob told them of the extraordinary kindness of Mr. Scrooge's nephew, whom he had scarcely seen but once, and who, meeting him in the streets that day, and seeing that he looked a little, just a little down, you know, said Bob, inquired what had happened to distress him, on which, said Bob, for he is the pleasantest spoken gentleman you ever heard, I told him. I am heartily sorry for it, Mr. Cratchit, he said, and heartily sorry for your good wife. By the by, how he ever knew that, I don't know. Knew what, my dear? Why, that you were a good wife, replied Bob. Everybody knows that, said Peter. Very well observed, my boy, cried Bob. I hope they do. Heartily sorry, he said, for your good wife. If I can be of service to you in any way, he said, giving me his card, that's where I live, pray come to me. Now it wasn't, cried Bob, for the sake of anything he might be able to do for us, so much as for his kind way, that this was quite delightful. It really seemed as if he had known our tiny Tim and felt with us. I am sure he has a good soul, said Mrs. Cratchit. You would be sure of it, my dear, returned Bob, if you saw and spoke to him. I shouldn't be all surprised, mark what I say, if he got Peter a better situation. Only hear that, Peter, said Mrs. Cratchit. And then, cried one of the girls, Peter will be keeping company with someone and starting up for himself. Get along with you retorted Peter, grinning. It's just as likely as not, said Bob, one of these days, though there's plenty of time for that, my dear, but however and whenever we part from one another, I am sure we shall none of us forget. Poor tiny Tim, shall we, or this first parting that there was among us? Never, father, cried they all. And I know, said Bob, I know, my dears, that when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, although he was a little, little child, we shall not quarrel easily amongst each other and forget poor tiny Tim in doing it. No, never, father, they all cried again. I am very happy, said Bob. I am very happy. Mrs. Cratchit kissed him, his daughters kissed him, the two young Cratchits kissed him, and Peter and himself shook hands. Spirit of tiny Tim, thy childish essence was from God. Spectre, said Scrooge, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I don't know how. Tell me what man was whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him as before, through a different time, he thought. Indeed, there seemed no order in these latter visions, save that they were in the future, into the resorts of businessmen, but showed him not himself. Indeed, the spirit did not stay for anything, but went straight on as to the end just now desired, until besought by Scrooge to tarry for a moment. The court, said Scrooge, through which we hurry now is where my place of occupation is and has been for a length of time. I see the house. Let me behold what I shall be in days to come. The spirit stopped. The hand was pointed elsewhere. The house is yonder, Scrooge exclaimed. Why do you point away? The inexorable finger underwent no change. Scrooge hastened to the window of his office and looked in. It was an office still, but not his. The furniture was not the same, and the figure in the chair was not himself. The phantom pointed as before. 
He joined in once again, and wondering why and whither he had gone, accompanied until they reached an iron gate, he paused to look round before entering a churchyard. Here, then, the wretched men whose name he had now to learn lay underneath the ground. It was a worthy place, walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds and growth of vegetation's death, not life, choked up with too much burying, fat with replanted appetite, a worthy place. The spirit stood amongst the graves and pointed down to one. He advanced towards it, trembling. The phantom was exactly as it had been, but he dreaded that he saw new meaning in his solemn shape. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, said Scrooge, answer me one question. Are these shadows of the things that will be? Or are they shadows of the things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed downwards to the grave by which it stood. Man's curses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if preserved in, they must lead, said Scrooge. But if the courses be departed from, the end will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I the man who laid upon the bed? He cried upon his knees. The finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. No, spirit! Oh, no, no! The finger still was there. Spirit, he cried, tight clutching at its robe. Hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been for this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? For the first time the hand appeared to shake. Good spirit, he pursued as down upon the ground he fell before it. Your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. The kind hand trembled. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past and the present and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me, tell me I may sponge away the writing on the stone. In his agony, he caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty and denied it. The spirit stronger yet repulsed him. Holding up his hands in a last prayer to save his fate reserved, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrank collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Stave 5. The End of It Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own, the room was his own, best and happiest of all. The time before him was his own, to make amends in. I will live in the past, the present, and the future, Scrooge repeated as he scrambled out of bed. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and the Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, old Jacob, on my knees. He was so fluttered and so glowing with his good intentions that his broken voice could scarcely answer to his call. He had been sobbing violently in his conflict with the spirit, and his face was wet with tears. They are not torn down, cried Scrooge, folding one of his bed curtains in his arms. They are not torn down, rings and all. They are here, I am here. The shadow of the things that would have been may be dispelled, 
They will be. I know they will be. His hands were busy with the garments all this time, turning them inside out, putting them on upside down, tearing them, mislaying them, making them parties to every kind of extravagance. I don't know what to do, cried Scrooge, laughing and crying in the same breath and making a perfect lacoon of himself with his stockings. I am as light as a feather. I am as happy as an angel. I am as merry as a schoolboy. I am as giddy as a drunken man. A merry Christmas to everybody. A happy new year to all the world. Hello there. Whoop, hello. He had frisked into the sitting room and was now standing there perfectly winded. There's the saucepan that the gruel was in, cried Scrooge, starting off again and going around the fireplace. There's the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered. There's the corner where the ghost of Christmas present sat. There's the window where I saw the wandering spirits. It's all right. It's all true. It all happened. <laughs> really, for a man who had been out of practice for so many years, it was a splendid laugh, a most illustrious laugh the father of long, long line of brilliant laughs. I don't know what day of month it is, said Scrooge. I don't know how long I have been among the spirits. I don't know anything. I am quite the baby. Never mind, I don't care. I'd rather be a baby. Hello, up, hello there. He was checked in his transports by the churches ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Clash, clash, hammer, ding, dong, bell, bell, dong, ding, hammer, clash, clash. Oh, glorious, glorious. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, clear, bright, jovial, staring, cold, cold, piping for the blood to dance to. Golden sunlight, heavenly sky, sweet fresh air, merry bells, oh glorious, glorious. What's today? cried Scrooge, calling downwards to a boy in Sunday clothes, who perhaps had loitered in to look about him. Eh? returned the boy with all its might of wonder. What's today, my fine fellow? said Scrooge. Today? replied the boy. Why, it's Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day, said Scrooge to himself. I haven't missed it. The spirits done it all in one night. They can do anything they like. Of course they can. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello, returned the boy. Do you know the poulterers in the next street but one? At the corner, Scrooge inquired. I should hope I did, replied the lad. An intelligent boy, said Scrooge. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What? The one as big as me, returned the boy. What a delightful boy, said Scrooge. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now, replied the boy. It is, said Scrooge. Go and buy it. Walker, exclaimed the boy. No, no, said Scrooge. I am in earnest. Go and buy it and tell him to bring it here, that I may give them the directions where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes, and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. He must have had a steady hand at a trigger who could have got a shot off half as fast. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's, whispered Scrooge, rubbing his hands and splitting with a laugh. He shan't know who sent it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Milner never made such a joke as sending it to Bob's will be. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one. 
but right it he did somehow and went downstairs to open the street door ready for the coming of the poulterer's man as he stood there waiting his arrival the knocker caught his eye i shall love it as long as i live cried scrooge patting it with his hand i scarcely ever looked at it before what an honest expression it has in its face it's a wonderful knocker here's the turkey hello whoop how are you merry christmas it was a turkey. He never could have stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped him short off in a minute like sticks of sealing wax. Why, it's impossible to carry that to Camden Town, said Scrooge. You must have a cab. The chuckle with which he said this, and the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey, and the chuckle with which he paid for the cab, and the chuckle with which he recompense the boy were only to be exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down breathless in his chair again and chuckled till he cried shaving was not an easy task for his hand continued to shake very much and shaving requires attention even when you don't dance while you're at it but if he had cut off the end of his nose he would have put a piece of sticking plaster over it and been quite satisfied he dressed himself all in his best and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present, and, walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded everyone with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant in a word that three, four good-humored fellows said, Good morning, sir, and a Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterwards that, of all the blithe sound he had ever heard, those were the blithest in his ears. He had not gone far when, coming on towards him, he beheld the portly gentleman who had walked into his counting-house the day before and said, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. It sent a pang across his heart to think how this old gentleman would look upon him when they met, but he knew what the path lay straight before him, and he took it. My dear sir, said Scrooge, quickening his pace and taking the old gentleman by both his hands, how do you do? I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. Mr. Scrooge? Yes, said Scrooge. That is my name, and I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon. And will you have the goodness? Here Scrooge whispered into his ear. Lord bless me! cried the gentleman as if his breath was taken away. My dear Scrooge, are you serious? If you please, said Scrooge, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Will you do me that favor? My dear sir, said the other, shaking hands with him, I don't know what to say to such many. Don't say anything, please, retorted Scrooge. Come and see me. Will you come and see me? I will, cried the old gentleman and it was clear he meant to do it. Thank ye, said Scrooge. I am much obliged to you. I thank you fifty times. Bless you. He went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted the children on their heads and questioned beggars and looked down into the kitchens of houses and up to the windows and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that anything, could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but he made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my dear? said Scrooge to the girl. Nice girl, very. Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? said Scrooge. 
He's in the dining room, sir, along with mistress. I'll show you upstairs if you please. Thank ye. He knows me, said Scrooge, with his hand already on the dining room lock. I'll go in here, my dear. He turned it gently and slided his face in round the door. They were looking at the table, which was spread out in great array, for these young housekeepers are always nervous on such points and like to see that everything is right. Fred, said Scrooge. Dear heart alive, how his niece by marriage started. Scrooge had forgotten for the moment about her sitting in the corner with a footstool, or he wouldn't have done it for any account. Why, bless my soul, cried Fred. Who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I have come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in? It was a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. And he was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. A wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office the next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. He was full eighteen minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with the door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. His hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen, as if he was trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice, as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I'm, I'm very sorry, sir, said Bob. I am behind my time. You are, repeated Scrooge. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. It's only once a year, sir, pleaded Bob, appearing from the tank. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend, said Scrooge. I am not going to stand for this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, he continued, leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in the waistcoat that he staggered back into the tank again. And therefore, I am about to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. He had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down with it, holding him and calling to the people in the court for help in a straight waistcoat. A merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge with an earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I will raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking Bishop Bob. Make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, a good a master, and a good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh. And little heeded them, for he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good, at which some people did not have their fill of laughter in the outset, 
and knowing that such as these would be blind anyway, he thought it quite as well that they should wrinkle up their eyes in grins as they have maladly in less attractive forms. His own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards, and it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. The end of a Christmas carol. I hope you've enjoyed some holiday spirits, and I hope you will have a wonderful new year coming up. Hope to see you then for some more adventures next year. Thanks for following me so far, for those who have really appreciate you joining me on this journey. Happy New Year.